All right, we are going to be continuing our way through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 21 through 29. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused. To do his deed, strange is his deed. And to work his work, alien is his work. Now therefore do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. Give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, sow cumin, and put in wheat and rose and barley in its proper place and emmer as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cart will over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drops his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. All right, now before we make way into those verses, we must do what we always do and back up. Review what we talked about last week before we move forward. That way we're keeping everything in its proper context. Now last week we made our way through Isaiah chapter 28 verses 14 through 20. Now, now of course this is Isaiah. God has given Isaiah this vision. But at this part in the vision, who is Isaiah speaking to? He is speaking to the leaders of the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you understand what the leaders have done, the leaders have rejected God. They had turned from God. But what is Isaiah doing here? He is once again warning the people of northern Israel, the leaders as well, about the wrath that is coming for them. So so it's not like God is one and done. No, God is a patient God. Because God has every right to send his wrath upon these people the very first time they reject him. But that's not what the true living God does here. Not with his people, not with these leaders that have rejected the promise that God has made them. And what is the promise that God made to these leaders in the northern kingdom? Did he not tell them that he was going to be their protector? Did he not tell them that he was going to be their provider? And yet, what are the leaders in the northern kingdom doing? They're they're looking to false gods. They're looking to the secular lands surrounding them. And why are they looking to them? For protection. As if what God says, they, they don't believe. They rejected it. And you think about everything that God has done for the Israelites. From the very beginning, he was the one that rescued them from Egypt. He was the one who freed them from Pharaoh. He was the one that crushed the most powerful army in the land. That being the Egyptian army. He rescued his own then and now his own at this point in time. The leaders have rejected him. And by way of the leaders rejected him, so have the Israelites followed the leaders. They were no longer praying to the one true God, thanking him for his protection throughout the years, thanking him for his provision throughout the years. No, instead, like I just said, they have turned to false gods, gods that man has created. We see here the leaders of the northern kingdom are relying upon their own knowledge. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Man relying upon themselves. To taking the commands that God has given us and, and us looking at it and saying, you know what, I, I think I got a better way of doing this. That's exactly what the leaders in northern Israel had done, or the northern kingdom of Israel have done. And then we're not far from them. We should be able to relate to them today. For we have the entire word of God. And, and what have we done? As the world, as the nation, we think we know better than God. So here God is showing 
this northern kingdom, showing the leaders, the, showing the citizens of this northern kingdom his grace and mercy by allowing Isaiah to be his mouthpiece, to speak on behalf of God. And here Isaiah is warning them, his wrath is coming, it's going to happen. Will you turn from your sins, O oh leaders? Will you cry out in repentance? Because God has told them through Isaiah that he has created the shelter for them that is going to protect them from his wrath. All they have to do is turn back to him. Because he's also telling them, he's also warning them, the very false gods that you believe, that they are protecting you, this shelter that you are now underneath by way of these pagan lands, it's not going to be able to stand when God's wrath comes. He is going to tear through them. And everyone who is under their protection is going to meet God's wrath. He's telling them, I know that you have rejected me time and time again, but turn back to me. You will be forgiven. And you will not face the wrath that is coming. And then let's, let's pause just for a second before we continue on into chapter 28. But you think about what's happening during that time. And, and so often when we talk about the Old Testament, what do people say? Well, you're just dealing with the angry God in the Old Testament. Well, we like the New Testament where we have hippie Jesus who loves everyone. Well, that's not the New Testament, but the Old Testament is not just about the wrathful God. Think about what God is doing by warning his own over and over and over. He is warning them. Do you not see God's grace and mercy all throughout the Old Testament the same as you do in the New? But on the flip side of that coin, yes, God's wrath is coming. And we need to hear this today because we have been promised that God's wrath is going to come again. And in the same way, the Old Testament saints, if they just turn to God, repent of their sins, then they will be rescued. How? Because if they believe God, then they believe in the Messiah who is promised. But for us today, the Messiah has already come, and if our faith is placed in Him, then we will be protected from the wrath that we so deserve. But His wrath is coming, and listen to me. That wrath is perfect. And you will answer for every single sin if your faith is not in Christ and in Him alone. All right. Here we go. Isaiah 28, verse 21. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon He will be roused to do His deed. Strange is His deed and to work His work. Alien is His work. So, so what are we hearing here? Well, Isaiah is using the words, of course, that northern Israel is familiar with. And why, why do we think northern Israel is familiar with these words? Because it's believed that what Isaiah is prophesying is what the false prophets are going to be claiming to northern Israel. So you have the true prophet Isaiah preaching about God's wrath, and then you're going to have the false prophet saying, wait a minute, do you not remember what he, God has done for his people before? The Lord fought for Israel against the Philistines at Mount Perizim. He fought for them there. He fought for the Israelites there, and he also fought against the Amorites in the Valley of Gibeon. So the false prophets are saying, he's not going to pour his wrath out upon you. That's not what's going to happen. He, he's protected us before. He's going to do it again. But the true prophet Isaiah is saying, no, you cannot listen to these false teachers for God's wrath is being promised. You must understand that it is 
coming. But just as he rose up against his people's enemies in the past, this time his own people have become the enemy. So that's what happens when the Israelites turn from God. Yes, he's rescued them time and time and time again. But there is a time when God will no longer be patient with the Israelites and his wrath was coming for them. So the false prophets, they can say whatever they want about how God protected them before, but the true prophet is saying something else. And for those whose faith is truly in God, they'll hear the words of Isaiah and they'll believe him over the false prophets. Now look at verse 22. It says, Now therefore do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong, for I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. Uh, Isaiah is telling the people there's still time. For you, O oh leaders, who are scoffers, hear my words. And for those of you who will not turn, for those of you who are set in your ways, who just have dug your heels in, have loved your sin, and you're just embracing it, do you know what you're actually doing? Because you know the truth. You're hearing the prophetic word come from my mouth. Do you know what you're actually doing by continuing to reject God's word after hearing it over and over and over again? You're making the eternal darkness that you're going to be thrown into darker and darker. Does God have to do any of this? No. God would be just and, and right to eliminate the Israelites right then and there. No warning. Because we're talking about the holy of holies. And, and who is he warning? The sinners who have rejected him. Guys, if we can't see God's grace and mercy just pouring out through all of this, and then we're missing it. For he's telling the leaders to turn while you still can, because destruction is coming. God's wrath is coming for the land. It has been promised. Look at verse 23. It says, Give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. Now, during the ancient times when Isaiah was speaking these very words, the leaders and the counselors, they would speak to the citizens in this manner. Give ear and hear my voice. Whenever it was something extremely important, this is how the leaders and the counselors would approach the citizens to make sure that they were paying attention. So what does Isaiah do? He uses their very words to grab their attention. Why is he doing this? Because this was going to determine for those leaders during that time and for some of the citizens during that time whether their eternal life was going to be spent, seen as righteous before God, or whether their eternal life was going to be that of damnation. So Isaiah is, is willing to say whatever he has to say to grab their attention. That hasn't changed. For we as believers are today, we're called to do the exact same thing. We are called to go out and make disciples. Why? Because you think about every person you encounter. Every person that you encounter is the thought that's running through your mind is, where, where is this place that they are going to be spending eternity? Where is it? 
Have they heard the truth? Do they believe it? Are you embarrassed to proclaim it? And yet here's Isaiah speaking to the powerful who are mocking him. There are false prophets going out behind him and saying, what this guy's saying isn't true? You you think Isaiah is popular during this time? He's talking about wrath coming upon them. They, They consider themselves to be holy. But he's calling them out. Now it's in this next verse, Isaiah starts out with a rhetorical question. Again, trying to grab their attention. Verse 24 says, Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and hollow his ground? So, of course, we know the answer to this. I, none of us in here, well, most of us in here aren't farmers. We've got some folks in the back that are. But for the, for the most part, we're, we're not farmers. We, we don't completely grasp this. But do you understand that the northern kingdom, they're, they're understanding exactly what Isaiah is saying? And no, no one is going to continuously plow the ground. If you just plow, then nothing is going to be sown and nothing is going to grow from that which you have plowed. Now during this time, when when a field was being plowed, there would be an ox or oxen and they would have this massive metal pointed stick that would be being pulled behind them and this would break up the ground about three inches deep. Then they would drag a couple of logs with metal poking out of those logs to level out the ground and smooth the seedbed. There was a process in which they would follow so that what they planted would grow. There were instructions that were laid out before them. Now look at verse 25. It says, when he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, sow cumin, and put in wheat and rows and barley in its proper place and emmer as the border? So each seed is to be sown in a certain area. And if you didn't plow the ground properly, then the seed was not going to take root. So you have the deal, and the deal is going to be scattered. The cumin is going to be sown. So again, well, we're seeing this illustration of how one is to properly plow and sow a field. That the farmer has been taught how to plow and how to plant each seed according to what best fits that seed. It's extremely important. The rules that must be followed. Verse 26, For he is rightly instructed his God teaches him. So just as the farmer follows instructions so that his crops will grow, do you understand what Isaiah is saying to the Israelite leaders? I have given you everything. God has given you everything. And what have you done with it? You're planting a field as if you have no instructions whatsoever. You're doing whatever you want. There's going to be no growth coming from you because you have mocked God. You have turned from Him. You are following the false gods. He promised to provide and to protect you. And you think you know a better way. Could you imagine if this is the way the farmer thought? Yeah, of course I've been taught how to plow this properly and where each seed needs to go. But you know what? I think I know better. I'm going to try it my way. Do you know what your way is going to bring you? This is what he's telling the leaders in Israel. He's saying, listen, your way is going to bring you nothing but death and destruction. He's warning them once again. He's crying out to them. 
Again, if we don't see God's grace and mercy just pouring out from these verses, then we need to read it again and again because God does not have to do this. He does not have to be patient with the sinner. Continuing with the illustration, look at verse 27. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cart wheeled over cumin, but dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. So Isaiah goes from the illustration of plowing and planting to the understanding of threshing. It is a step-by-step process. And what he's saying here is that you're not going to use the same technique for larger seeds that you're going to use for smaller ones. Do you understand how detailed God was with his people? It wasn't as if it was a couple of sentences and then God said, well, go figure it out. Good luck. Go back to Exodus. We made our way through it. He was extremely detailed. But to the leaders during that time, because they were just so enthralled with their their sin, with their pride, they've taken the instructions that God had given them. And they're just saying, I know a better way to do this. You know what this kind of reminds me of? It reminds me a a bit of the church today and how we don't take the commands and the word of God seriously. So often we think, "Ah, we can come and hang out at church for a couple of hours a week. We can endure what the man behind the podium or what the man behind the pulpit may be saying. And then we're going to go live our lives the way we want. I mean, because we've already checked that off our list. Let's see, we were there Sunday morning at 9.30. We listened to that. And and then we go and we sing songs. And then we listen to another guy speak for another 45 minutes or so. Then, Then we go Wednesday night. We listen to the prayer service. And then we go and listen to that same guy speak again for 30 minutes or so. And that's all we need to do. We don't need to worry about going out into the world and actually listening and obeying what God has told us through the Word. I know we talk about false idols, and we sit here and we think today. Yeah, but they they were stupid back then. They were were dumb. They, They would create these things with their hands and then they worship it. Sadly, we still do that today. You look at where you spend the majority of your Sunday mornings, and that's your idol. We still have idols. We have created these things that we find more important than the Word of God. I'm not saying you got to be in here every time the doors are open. Please hear me when I say that. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is where you spend the majority of your time when the church doors are open, That's your idol. And then you know what's what's sad? This is is sad, and it's going to sound, it's going to come out wrong. I hope not, but it may come out wrong. But for for some of us today, our, our children have become our idols. 
I mean, you, you think about it. What, whatever it is they want to do, that, that's the most important thing. Regardless of when it takes place. For it's no longer the parent who is leading and guiding the child. It is now the child leading and guiding the parents. Verse 28. Does one crush grain for bread? No. He does not thresh it forever. Of course, threshing is important when it comes to creating bread. But only until the wheat is separated from the chaff. Threshing is only part of making bread. It's not the end, but a means to get there. He continues and says, when he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. Again, with farming, there are specific details, instructions that we must follow. There's instructions that one must hold to. And there's consequences if you don't. And now we sit here and we read this today, and it's like, well, this isn't a big deal to us. But, but during the time of Isaiah... Just picture your crops not coming up. Do you know what that means? For many, you're not going to eat. There's no way that you're going to be able to trade to make a living. You're in trouble. Why? Because as a farmer, you think you know better? That you can do it your own way? No, that's insane. That's what Isaiah... That's what he's telling the leaders of this time. God has given you everything you need, and yet you think you know better. God gave them protection, guidance, leadership, provisions, and, and he was going to continue to do so if you were obedient. Look at verse 29. Here Isaiah has laid out this illustration. You can picture him speaking to the leaders of the, the northern kingdom. And he says this, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. Meaning God also has said, God has spoken. For he is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. By him saying that, do you know what he's saying to the leaders during that time? You all are fools. You all are finite little fools. Here you have the wonderful counsel of God who is excellent in his wisdom and you're relying upon your own self. Here you are relying upon these false gods that are made by man and you're expecting them to protect you? You're running to these foreign lands for protection? And you have the almighty counselor who is perfect in wisdom leading and guiding you? He's saying, how dare you? What is wrong with you? We should be able to relate to this today as believers. For he has given us everything that we need. He has given us the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that's regenerated our hearts so that we can believe this very word. And, and yet there are still times as believers, we mock his word. We reject his commands the same way in which the, 
leaders in the northern kingdom did. God has every right to drop his wrath upon us whenever he sees fit. God has every right not to regenerate a single one of us. But you see what he did to the leaders in the northern kingdom. He provided them chance after chance after chance, warning after warning after warning. Thankfully, thankfully, he does the same for us today. But what we must understand is that as believers, as believers, we need we need to be doing the same thing that Isaiah was doing. I'm not talking about going out and telling people about your dreams and visions because they'll just laugh at you as they should. But you should be giving them the word, the truth. You should be out there making disciples because his wrath, just like it was then, was coming for that northern kingdom. And it is for us today. But you have the good news. Questions?